Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, we are starting a brand new series today called Heart Shifts, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, but let me start here with Christmas. <sighs> Got to tell a little thing about Christmas. Now, I know you're not even pumpkin spiced yet, <laughs> but a little bit of story about Christmas. So, Christmas gifts, you, you, you gather around as a family and you trade all your gifts back and forth, and it's one of the best parts of Christmas, amen? Second service, are you going to tell the truth today? Amen, right? So it's like you're, you're doing the gifts and everybody's opening their gifts and, and gifts are great and gifts, are, gifts are, 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 I don't know, they're fun, but it's like, but what are they more deeply? What are the gifts at Christmas more deeply? Well, the gift is that somebody took some time and they decided to know you and they decided to go and brave the shopping mall. God help them. And find out what matched you. And when you open that up and, and you feel that connection with that person and it's love, right? That's what that gift is. That gift is love. And sometimes, even though that heart thing that's in the gift, that heart thing had heart at one time, sometimes it loses its heart. And sometimes we find ourselves at Christmas and everybody's just trading gift cards, and putting cash in cards. And we just trade them around. And it's okay. And I get it. We've had the years where it's like that's all we could do too. Because we were so busy or whatever else. But it's like, but can we also be honest that something got lost there? You know, you get the heart thing that should have the heart. And sometimes it doesn't have the heart. Sometimes it becomes kind of an empty shell and you kind of miss out. I remember uh, there was a Valentine's Day. Linda and I went to um, the greatest uh, Italian restaurant ever. It's called Biagi's. It's in Peoria, Illinois. And they have this wonderful crusty Italian bread and they have creme brulee and, you know, they get out the, 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 the blowtorch, right? And like do the creme brulee. It's for real. It's so, so good. And so we're going there one year and we got the babysitter and we're, we're early on, right? And uh, in our marriage. And, and I remember us sitting there and this is before smart phones, by the way. It's before smartphones. We're that old. Where it's before smartphones. And we're sitting there, and I just remember noticing all the couples around us at the different tables. Uh, not every single one, but a lot of them were just sitting there silent. They weren't talking. They were just sitting there at the table eating really expensive Italian food and calling it a date. But they're not talking. They're not connecting. They're just eating. And I remember looking around, Linda and I were talking about it afterwards. It's like, you know, why? And did I mention it's before smartphones? Because some of you are like, well, that's where we do smartphones. It's like, yeah, but don't, don't let your parents lie to you. Love was hard to keep alive even before smartphones. And sometimes you've got the heart thing like the date. And the heart thing is supposed to have the heart in it. But sometimes it doesn't have the heart in it anymore. It's just a shell. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, and it's okay to keep having the date. And it's okay to have the heart to revive. But you need to know what you're trying to revive. You need to know why you're paying so much money for Italian food is for the connection of the hearts, not for the food itself. Can I get a better amen? And now, so we're starting a brand new series and this series is super important for us. Pastor Ricky and I were talking about this. It's like, let's do a series on the habits of the Christian life. Let's do a series on, these are all the things that we're supposed to do, God tells us to do, because these help us get closer to God. So here's a quick list. We need to obey God's voice when he speaks to us. We need to engage with the Bible, read the Bible, study the Bible, talk about the Bible. We need to speak with God. We need to worship. We belong, need to belong to authentic community and connect with the congregation. And as soon as he and I started to talk about this list of habits that we need to talk about as a church, we started to feel the guilt coming on. Amen? Oh, yeah. I ought to, I ought to obey more. I, I ought to read the Bible more. I ought to pray more. I ought to worship more. I should really go to church more often. I should really get into a life group. I should, I should, I should, I should, I should. You feel all the guilt? Because we, we should. 
But you shouldn't just should. You should want it for the heart that's there. Because it's not about you're a church person, so you should. It's about the fact that there's a relationship that you either have with God or don't have with God. A friendship that you're supposed to have with God. And we should want it. Because we love him. Yes? Because we want him. And, and, and the heart behind it is really what matters at the end of the day. It's so massive. I would even say this. All this guilting that we learned to do when we were kids. And I should, I should, I should, I should. I would argue that it's the guilt that makes us not want to do it ever. Because it's kind of the way that we work. The more guilt I feel, the less I actually want to go to the gym. Yes? <laughs> it is. But heart things matter. There's a psychologist, Chris Thurman, last year wrote a book, said um, the title of the book was called Stop Shooting All Over Yourself. <laughs> Did I say that slowly enough? <laughs> Stop shooting all over yourself. Because we do. And we get so used to it. And we get so used to it and we do it all the time. And here's where we end up landing. We end up landing at going to the date and paying a lot of money for food. And there's no heart connection there. Because we're just going through the motions. And we're just going through it with God. So here's how it ought to look for you. Here's the heart shift. We need to go from, dang, I should pray more. <laughs> to, dang, I miss him. I want to talk to him. Dang, I used to know Jesus. Dang, we used to be close. And I just want to get closer. And that should be the heart cry of the Christian. Because if we don't realize that that is what it's about, we'll get lost and we'll, we'll have empty shells to love him, to miss him, to want him. That is what matters. And it's so scary to preach about. I'll just be real with you. It's scary to preach about because it's so much easier to preach about rules. It's so much pre easier to preach to you about here's exactly how you do a thing. It's really hard to preach to you about here's how to have a love relationship with the Savior. For you and Jesus to go into the Holy of Holies together and have an actual conversation. To have an actual love relationship, friendship. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice... Right? They can open the door and they can sign up for a church and warm a seat, a pew for the rest of their lives. It's not what it says. It says, if they'll open the door, then I will come in and I will eat with them and they with me. What does Jesus want? Jesus wants a meal. A meal with heart. Why? Because it's a relationship. That's what he wants. John 14, 15. He's going to talk more about this. Look what he says. He says, if you love me, Obey my commandments. So Jesus draws a very direct line, says, if you love me, you will obey what I command you to do. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. He's talking about the Holy Spirit who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you in to all truth. And so God's love and loving God is synonymous with following his commandments. Does that mean the 10 commandments? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It, it means following the will of God written into his word. But it's also way more than that. That's why he comes right in. And he says, but I'm also giving you the Holy Spirit. Because this is a day in, day out thing. This is a relationship. Like I'm going to tell you stuff and I need you to do that stuff. Is it because it's an authoritarian dictatorship with God? No. It's not that. It's that, like Bob Dylan said... You got to serve somebody. Old song. You kids don't know it. That's okay. You got to serve somebody. Bob Dylan's point was, and it's actually in scripture, you have a master and you're obeying somebody whether you know it or not. And some of us are obeying and we're serving and we're worshiping our spouses or we're obeying our kids and every new thing that they want. 
or we're still obeying the voice of our moms and dads, and they might not even be alive anymore, but we're still trying to do everything that we can to make them proud, and we refuse to do anything else because it, dad might not have been proud. And some of us, it's the addiction that we've got in our own life, and we're obeying the voice of the addiction in our own life instead of the voice of God. We're obeying something. We're all obeying something. God's just coming in and saying, how about you get free of those things that destroy you and obey the only safe master in the universe? Because the more you obey me, the more your life is going to start to make sense. And the more you trust me, your life is going to start to make sense. And not only that, but the more that you obey me, you're actually stepping onto the path that I'm already walking. God's already walking. Verse 21, those who accept my commandments and obey them, Jesus said, are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them and I will love them and I will reveal myself to each of them. So do you see what happens? He says, you start loving me. You start coming onto my path. And he's like, and I'm gonna be loving you back and I'm gonna be revealing more and more of God to you. And this relationship is just really, really gonna work. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be rich. It's gonna be healthy. Have you ever seen a family go to the movie theater and they get up to the front desk to buy their tickets and they all want to see a different movie? And that's okay. And they all buy tickets to different movies and go into different theaters all alone. And later on, what'd you do Friday night? We all went to see a movie. No, you didn't. You all went to see separate movies. You didn't have time together. And you know what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just an illustration. But sometimes we choose to do things separately. Whenever Linda and I get in a bad place in our marriage because we're too busy, she's got this phrase she always uses with me and it gets me every time. She says, Josh, I feel like we're living separate lives right now. I feel like you're going down one road and I'm going down another road. And that's, that's my wake up call because we're in relationship. It's supposed to be together. That's what God is saying. That's what he's saying here. He says, you, you start walking with me. We're going to love you. We're going to start revealing God to you. The relationship is going to work. He keeps talking in verse 23. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And so he goes even further. He's like, not only will we love you, he's like, but God is going to make his home with you. And he doesn't just say, you, the church, in mass. He says, each of you. Sometimes I'm really good at God loves the world. God loves us all. This says, God will make his home with you individually. That's powerful. What do you mean make your home with me? Those are big words, God. What are we talking about here? You want to come and make your home with me as an individual. Okay, let's see it in the Bible. Like, go back to Garden of Eden, and they ate the fruit, and they weren't supposed to eat the fruit. Do you know what the heartache of Eden was? Is that they had to be separated from God. Because he had come and he had walked with them in the cool of the day, and they had had relationship. And it was the friendship that, 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 that had to be separated because of their choice. And that was the heartache, the heartbreak of Eden. And then God comes to Moses and says, let's have you build a tabernacle. Why are we going to build a tabernacle? So you can come and you can worship God. And God can be amongst his people in the right way in the tabernacle. And then the scripture says that God would speak to Moses when he went into the tabernacle as a man speaks to his friend. Do you see the relationship? And then you've got David coming along in Psalm 23 and says, the Lord is my shepherd. And that means I lack nothing. He, he, he guides me by right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. You see David there? He's got this relationship with God that's an actual friendship. It's not a religious system of rules and activities that he's just following. It's a relationship. And then Amos comes, or Micah, Micah 6, 8 comes along and says, God has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with your God, to walk humbly with your God. That is what God desires of us. And then Jesus comes and John chapter one says, the coming of Jesus was like the word had become flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's his house, his tent. He came and lived among us. That was the great joy of Jesus was to be present. God with us, Emmanuel. He wanted to be with us. Do you see the burning heart of God? And then Jesus is coming and saying, and here's how it works for you individually. And I spit a lot just then. Are we okay? <laughs> Sorry, it was your direction. <laughs> I was very excited. But Jesus comes and says, here's how you get God to make his home with you. Is walk with him, obey him. This is the life. And then we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and it's the end of all things. And the most beautiful prophecy in the book of Revelation is this. And some of you guys know this from chapter 21. And it says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. It's, it's the longing of God, his heart, that the culmination of all things God will finally be fully 100% restored to his people in friendship. And a lot of us have lost the plot. A lot of us are doing heart things without the heart in them. And they've become an empty shell of religion for us. And we got to get back to it. And we got to get back to it for the right reasons. Not because we should, 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 should. But because we should miss him and we should want him and we should love him. Jesus even explained that as he walked the earth, that he walked so closely with the father himself, God, the son, God, the father, they walked so closely hand in hand together that it, 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 it was a pattern for them. And he explains the pattern to us. This is going to blow your mind. This is John chapter 5, verse 19. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. And whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything that he's doing. So, so let's break this apart a bit at a time. Jesus is saying, as he's walking along, he notices things. It's not that Jesus woke up that day and he had all of this stuff mapped out and planned out. That's not what he's saying here. He says, no, he's walking along and he notices that the father is doing something over here. And what's the father doing? Well, the father's doing ministry in somebody's heart. The father's doing a thing and all of a sudden Jesus, and, and it's been invisible, right? The father's been doing this thing in this person. It's been invisible. Jesus is walking along and all of a sudden he sees the activity of the father. It's revealed to him. What's he say? He says he knows that whenever he sees that, the father's already been working, he needs to stop what he's doing and join the father. And the father does that. The father reveals it to him because the father loves him. Loves him enough to interrupt his life. And he says, I can't do anything by myself. Does that sound familiar to you? I can't do anything in the Christian life by myself. I've got to follow the father. Is that the 10 commandments? Yes, but it's so much more. It's I've got to be interrupted daily by God. And I've got to follow what he tells me to do. There was a day I was uh, uh, real young. I was in, in my early 20s and, and I, I, was, I was working in technology and I came down to my car and it was, it was night and it was, it was winter in Illinois. It was super cold. And there was a man came walking up toward me as I was walking toward my car. And I was a little scared. I'll be real with you. It was dark. And he came up and he said, I'm cold. And I gave him my coat. And he said, I need money. I don't remember how much it was. It's like, I need food and I need this, I need that. Okay. So I put this strange man that I've never met before in my car because I hadn't thought that through and I drove him to a cash station, hadn't thought that through either. And I got some money for him and I drove him and, and he said, can you drive me to this one location? I drove him where he wanted to go and it was not a good neighborhood at all. And I was a little scared at that too. And, 
And I dropped him off in front of this house. And he's like, he's like, I'll be, he's like, I'll be right back. He's like, I just got to make sure that they're home. And he walks up to that front door and a light pops on and a woman comes to the door and he starts talking to her. I'm still in my car. I can't hear anything that they're saying. And he just looks back at me and he just gives me the thumbs up and walks right in the, into the house. And I'm driving away and I'm like, God, did I just pay for somebody to see a prostitute? I don't know. Or did I just pay for a guy to just go get drugs somewhere? I don't know. And I remember driving away and thinking, you know, well, whatever he did with it, like I was giving that gift to God, like an offering. And it was to God and that's between him and God. If he did something wrong with it, that's, that's their issue. And that, that rationale kind of kept me going for a little while. But later on, I felt like God came to me and said, wait a second, it's way more than that. And he gave me Matthew 5:45. And there's this verse where God says, I cause my sun to shine on the good and the bad. And I cause my rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And what God was saying to me was, I don't evaluate every single human being's sinlessness before I choose to pour out blessing on them. The, the overwhelming generosity of God and his love is he pours out blessings on everybody. Yeah. Do you know that? And, and, and it's part of the way that he overwhelms them with his grace. And he overwhelms them, even people who aren't Christians, he overwhelms them with his love and his generosity. That's what he longs to do. And he's like, Josh, I just kind of pulled you into the flow of what I, I do all the time. I asked you to bless somebody whether they deserved it or not. I asked you to bless somebody whether they're going to use it right or not. Can you just be okay with being part of that? Woo! And it changed me, gave me a different outlook on what giving was. And, and, and here's the thing, and don't get me wrong, I still get hung up on whether or not somebody's gonna like truly abuse money I'm giving away and stuff like that. There's a line, right? Like there's, there's good ways to have those thought processes and those discussions, but there's this other side of it. And, and the point, the reason I'm trying to say this to you today is because I was walking along and God the Father brought a man up and I had an opportunity to step into the flow of what God was doing. And when I chose to do that, who won? I did. Because I got onto the thrill ride with Jesus. I got to go and have an adventure with what Jesus was doing in this man's life. And I got to get closer to God. I got to hear his voice. And I got to understand some things and grow a little bit that I never understood before. And I could have chosen not to do it. But hearing the voice of God and adjusting your life and deciding to go forward with him, it's better. Here's how to obey God's voice in three steps. Super basic. Watch for God's interruptions. Number two, obey him now, not later. It matters. Three, obey God fully when he speaks to you, not partially. I've got an example in the gospels of Jesus getting interrupted himself where he was planning to do one thing and he got interrupted with another thing. And I want you to see it. And I want you to see how he walked through it because he's such a model for us. So this is Mark chapter five, verse 24. And the part I'm not gonna read to you, but I'll just tell you it happens right before this passage is Jesus, there's a man who comes to him named Jairus. And Jairus is the head of a local synagogue, kind of the church for the Jewish people at that time, the kind of lo the local church. Jairus has a daughter who's close to death. And so they come to Jesus. And what Jairus believes is what a lot of people at that time believed. Even though Jesus could heal people, they didn't think he could raise the dead. And so there was this urgency, right? Like Jairus is like, you got to come and you got to come now before she dies. Because if you could get just a little bit of your healing power to her, then she'll be okay but I don't want it to be too late. 
And so there's this urgency and there's this plan. And so Jesus is like, sure, I'll go. And they all start to go. And this is Matthew 5, 24. Jesus went with him. That's Jairus. And all the people followed, crowding around Jesus. And a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. And she had suffered a great deal for many doctors. And over the years, she spent everything that she had to pay. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Verse 27, she had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him right at that moment, right? Behind him through the crowd, touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Just let me tell you something really quick. The condition that she had, according to Jewish tradition and law at that time would have meant that she was considered unclean, religiously unclean. And if she touched anybody else, she risked making them unclean too, to the point where they would say, hey, if she had touched Jesus, Jesus couldn't even walk into the temple and worship because he was now unclean for a period of time. Now you can think and argue all that stuff all you want. Here's what it really means though in this passage, that for 12 years, she felt like an outcast. For 12 years, she didn't feel like she could touch anybody. Imagine how that would have been, how isolating that would have been for her. So she comes up in the midst of the crowd, and this is why she thinks the way that she does. It's, I'm not going to touch Jesus. I'm just going to touch the edge of his robe. Because that will make him unclean. And she's trying to be kind, but she really wants her miracle. And do you sense her desperation? And then she gets healed. Jesus realized, verse 30, at once the healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my robe? Do you think he already knew who touched his robe? Yes. His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. I love the disciples. They're so logical (laughs) and so slow. Not at all like us. We're we're way better. Um, Here's a logical thought. If Jesus knew she had been healed and she knew she had been healed, why didn't he just move on? She got her miracle. I got to hurry. I got to get to J. Iris' daughter. We, we were on our way to something. Did, didn't you look at my calendar? I had a thing. It's because the relationship Verse 33, then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of Jesus, told Jesus what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. See, she'd gotten her miracle, but she hadn't gotten relationship yet. She, she, she had been healed, but she, she didn't have a connection with God yet. And all that isolation and all that like, I'm not worthy and, and, and people can't touch me. People can't be around me. That was the real core issue there. And Jesus ministered to both. And I love that about him. And don't miss, he calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. I looked that up. The word he uses for daughter, the word daughter in the Greek, it's the only time he uses it as a name for somebody in the Gospels. Only this time. Why? Because you could have called her woman, but you didn't. God stood before her and said, daughter. Because she needed that. That was worth stopping for. That was worth getting interrupted for. And what did he do? What did our Savior do? Right? He's like, he... He saw what the father was doing. All of a sudden, power went out for me. The father's working. The father's doing a thing. I got to stop everything, and I got to go be a part of what the father's doing. And see, that impulse needs to be in us, not because we should, but because we want to walk with Jesus. Somebody say amen. This is how it worked. This is how it's supposed to work with us. Every interruption in your life is God calling you back to friendship. So where are your interruptions at? When was the last time you got interrupted? 
And I ask the question because sometimes we don't feel like we're getting interrupted by God because we've stopped listening. We've stopped being attentive to what's the Holy Spirit doing. And we need to start this practice again so that we'll get closer to him. I said earlier, God doesn't just love the world, he loves me. And the distinction is important. The kids in Sunday school know it. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, yes? Yes, and that's precious to us. And we remember the song. And some of us in our darkest hours, we go back to that song. Why? Because it's so personal. And we remember what we used to cherish about the Lord. Jesus loves me. He walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And I was a little Baptist kid singing that old hymn and I had no idea what the words meant. And it wasn't until later, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Some of you guys know that one. And the voice I hear calling on my ear, the son of God discloses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And the ancients knew this. They knew what it was to walk with God and to have a friendship with God that was a fire in their life. And guys, I'll just be real with you. My own relationship with God, this is the center of who I am. This is, this is the center of me. It is not church. It is not religion. It is not being a pastor. It is this. It is the friendship I have with the most high God. And it's real. And it has to be real. You have to be filled from the actual source, if you're going to pour out on anybody else. And I'll also be honest with you, it's a one-sided relationship. I stink at it. I ignore God. I go on and on without acknowledging him. And you know what's great about him? He never gets bitter. Because you do, you got those friends, right? Like, You'll get busy and you won't call them and then they get mad and then they get hurt and the friendship starts to, starts to break apart. And then you got that one friend, that one crazy friend. Then no matter how long it's been, if you finally call or they finally call you, immediately you hop on the phone it's like we never left. Do you have that friend? That's the way God is. Never gets bitter. Always keeps coming after me. Love that about him. There was a guy and his marriage fell apart and he and his wife were separated. And I hadn't talked to him in years. And I walked into Walmart, standing there checking out a sale, you know, because there's always a sale. And he comes walking up out of the blue, tells me right in the middle of Walmart, He's like, my marriage is falling apart. We're separated. And he's like, and I'm not willing to let it go. He's like, where do you go to church? I want to get baptized. I want to get into counseling. I want to fight for this thing. How do I fight for this thing? And I just, I want to let you know that guy could have walked the other way. But God was drawing him and it was an interruption in his life. And I'm like, am I going to walk the road with God here? Because God's got good things for me. Just a couple weeks ago, there was a guy I knew of in this church and he needed to get out of state and he had no money and he had no help. And it's one of these things where it's like, all of a sudden he was... He was just in the office doing something and I kind of saw him out of the corner of my eye and all of a sudden he was out the front door. I couldn't even catch him. And one of the staff people said, oh, he's on his way to his flight. And he runs out to the curb and hops in the car. And I recognized the car and it was a guy from our church and the guy was taking care of him. And I never heard from the guy. He was just doing what God put in front of him to do. And he was getting on the thrill ride with Jesus. Do you see that? He's blessed. You're like, well, he was blessing the other guy. Yeah, but he was blessed. Because he's coming in close. There was a time I was preaching and I said something that wasn't in the notes. 
always a bad idea. That can go, that can go south real quick. And it's like, I worked so hard on these sermons, okay? But sometimes the Lord will just insert something mid-preach. And then afterward, all these people come up and it's like, that's exactly what I needed. The thing I didn't study. Thank you, Lord. I love it. Because he's in control. He just does stuff. So I'm in the middle of this one sermon and midway through we're talking about forgiveness and stuff like that and it was just out of my mouth before I even thought about it and I said you know abortion is not the unforgivable sin in anybody's life and it was just out moved on forgot I had even said it we got to the end of the sermon that day and this woman comes walking up to the prayer team and I was standing there with them and she makes a beeline right for me and her husband's in tow. He's coming, coming with her. And, and I, I can't tell you what leaders these two people were in our church. They had led, I, I'd personally seen them in leadership for decades. Helped so many people. And she just revealed what had been in her heart and what she had done and how condemned she felt for what she had done and and how she had sat there all that time and feeling like she would never be forgiven. And the husband's just standing there, just tender, just tender with her and just broken for her. And you can tell they've talked about this countless, countless times. And I got to stand with them and pray. And we got to speak truth to lies. And I think about this. I think about when she was sitting in the chairs and the Holy Spirit came up to her and said, go up to prayer team. When she go up and tell your pastor, your past. How much did she not want to do that? She didn't want to do that. Oh. And the courage it took. And there's the Lord drawing her and inviting her and saying, just walk on this path with me. Walk on this journey with me. I've got good things for you. If you trust me. And she did. Isn't that good? Would you guys stand? Jesus is so much better than we know. So much more personal than we know. Let's pray. Lord, many of us here watching online, God, we, we remember what it was like to feel really close to you and it's been a long time. And Lord, we'd like to get closer. So Lord, I pray that you would call us, God, all during this series, God. I pray that you would call us. Call us not to guilt, Lord. Call us to grace. Call us not to law. But the reckless love of the children of God. Call us to it, Lord. You're good. I pray that you'd rescue us. We love you. Amen.